Okay, we'll bring the meeting back to order. We have a uh, small uh, video, short video here to show. I think everybody would be quite interested in it, but I'll let Kim introduce it. All right, welcome back, Council. So, so pleased to be able to share this with you this afternoon um, uh, with uh, Randy's great work and Rob Hatton was on site and Matt Wortman from the GIS department. We flew the drone over the Rockwood Terrace site. I don't know if some of you remember the site that we started with, but this is the this is the site that they have now, the condition of it. Um, tremendous amount of work has happened on the site. I think they have about 15 people working on there full time to try and uh, get as much done as they can before the weather turns, but really amazing. You can look at <laughs> that. Rather immense pile of soil is the um, excess soil that's been removed from the site. No, um, <laughs> yes, we're going to start charging for toboggan rides. You can start to see the difference there. Um, there's that's a, a dry storm pond there. There's the existing Rockwood Terrace in the background. And so then this is Rock Street that you're looking at now. Compared to the hill that that was, it's really amazing. <laughs> So that's the on the on the right hand side of the screen. That's the county's part of the county's other twenty acres over there. So that's why we're moving the soil from one side to the other. Um, we'll manage it in the future. And then uh, that you're looking at now. Yes. Compared to the hill that that was. Oh, it's there's, really there's the anyway. <laughs> so part of the county's as you can over there. So that's why we're moving the soil from one side to it's, the other. Uh, there we are. Okay. And then, anyway, I don't know if there's anything you want to add, but um, you can see that the grade change compared to where it was um, in the trees. And then that's the, the curling club. For those of you that we went, when we went did our original orientation, we were at the curling club. That's the curling club building there. It's, uh, there we are. Okay. And I see. I, don't I said that you wrong, didn't I? I said rock. Did I say rock instead of Saddler? Rock Street and South Street. South Street, yes. Um, and that's the the curling club for those. So of there's this that's South Street on the side of uh, on the right side of your screen that divides our property from uh, from DSPIs. But I said that wrong, didn't I? I said rock. Did I? Say pretty amazing the amount of change. So they're doing servicing right now. You can see where they've got some trenches dug. So they're putting the um, the water and wastewater pipes in the ground. And, uh, so I think this should make a difference to us when it comes time to tender the actual construction, starting from a site that looks like this compared to uh, what was um, a pretty green field uh, earlier. I, I hope that makes a real difference in the, in the way that could the um, potential contractors will be able to uh, construct their bids. So we just wanted to show you that. That was just from this week. So, you know, thanks Sorry. to Rob and Matt and Randy and everybody for uh, getting Sorry. that information. And uh, I think we're, the intent is that we're going to try and get some of this stuff posted, eh? whether either parts of the video or some stills, at least, so the public will be able to, to see the progress um, as it happens. I just wanted to show you that. That was just from yeah, this Yeah, well, just from that. Great. To Rob and Matt. Yeah, and so Mary Lou will now come up and talk a little bit about human services. Thank you, Kim. And welcome back, Mary Lou. <clears throat> Thank you. So now we're going to move into the human services portion of today's budget meeting. Uh, there's a slight change of plans uh, as opposed to uh, social services going up first. We're going to move to long-term care. So the, the 2020-24 budget for human services which encompasses social services. Uh, so you look at Ontario Works, um, childcare, housing, long-term care and paramedic services requires a levy of $32,415,600 compared to $28,126,200 in 2023, an increase of $4,289,400. And as a reminder, this also includes the uh, redevelopment of Rockwood Terrace. So I'll turn it over to Jen. Um, if you're looking at your package, that's page 127. So the long-term care proposed budget, operating and capital, including redevelopment of 
with a levy of just shy of 11 million compared to just shy of 8.3 million in 2023. So that's an increase of $2,681,100. Thank you, Mary Lou. Good afternoon. Did you want to? Yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, you got it. Okay, good. Good afternoon, Council. That video is so exciting. And I think we'll have some, our plan is to have some time lapse videos as well. So that'll be fun. And I'm sure there's some residents that would just love to be out there watching all that, <laughs> those big trucks and um, equipment moving dirt around. Uh, so thanks for the introduction, Mary Lou. I always like to begin with a reminder of the promise of Gray County long-term care, which is to color it your way by providing resident-centered care. Resident-centered care is supporting each resident with their unique care needs for both their physical and emotional well-being. This care and support is provided by our team members in each home. The proposed budget supports this promise in several ways an investment in staff retention, specifically personal support workers and allied health professionals, a focus on nutrition and meal service, and sustaining the building and maintenance upkeep. This year, along with the rest of the county, this department is experiencing a high inflationary pressures and personnel costs that have resulted in a higher cost to maintain operations and quality of care. Long-term care funding consists of county funding, provincial funding, miscellaneous revenue, and receipts from residents. Long-term care accommodation costs are set by the Ministry of Long-Term Care and are standard in all provincially funded long-term care homes across Ontario. If a resident does not have enough income to pay for the basic room, the resident should be eligible for subsidy through the Long-Term Care Home Rate Reduction Program. The province also provides long-term care homes with monthly payments in four level of care funding envelopes, nursing and personal care, program and support services, raw food, and other accommodation. Uh, only semi-private and private revenues can provide additional funding to assist with the accommodation costs, but these semi-private and private rates cannot exceed the accommodation rate maximums set by the ministry. As well, the number of semi-private and private beds are regulated by the province with a maximum of 60% 60, 60 of the beds in a long-term care facility being able to be preferred so semi-private or private. The Committee of Management is responsible to oversee the budget for Grey Gables, Lee Manor, and Rockwood Terrace, and the committee had an opportunity to review this proposed budget at the November 14th meeting. In addition to the reductions that were made during County Council pre-budget workshops of a, approximately $524,000, an additional reduction of $179,000 was made by the Long-Term Care Committee of Management. This budget was developed through the collaborative efforts of Gray County Finance and Long-Term Care staff. Uh, and Mary Lou already highlighted the um, kind of overall uh, operating and capital expenses and the, the levy impact. So as I mentioned, budget income impacts are um, the, the funding that's available and the expenditures that are going out. And so I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the funding. So historically, the homes receive an increase in base funding from the ministry each year applied directly to those four envelopes that I mentioned. A 1.5% funding increase for global level of care has been budgeted for April 1st, which matches the percentage and timing of historical funding increases. But, we, but it's still uncertain. Uh, we've, we're doing this based on history. Case mix index, in addition to base funding, the homes receive resident acuity, so care needs funding, which is referred to as the case mix index. The higher the CMI index, the higher the acuity of the residents and the more nursing and personal care funding that the home may receive. Despite rising acuity in all long-term care homes in Ontario, the CMI system allocates the acuity funding envelope, but does not change the size of the funding envelope. So the pie just gets sliced differently. The size of the pie doesn't change. Using our um, advocacy group, uh, Advantage Ontario, we belong to uh, Advantage Ontario. They have a CMI calculator 
we're anticipating a decrease of $306,000 in total across the three homes in the acuity funding in the CMI funding. And again, we won't know that until April, 2024. Uh, resident co-payment is, um, I've already kind of highlighted a little bit about co-payment and those increases are effective in July, July 1st of each year. And those, those are listed in the summary in front of you. In terms of expenditures, wages and benefits account for over 80% of the 2024 budget. Challenges with recruitment and retention of qualified employees leads to a higher dependence on overtime and use of agency staff, both of which have a direct in impact on the cost of service delivery. This budget proposes an investment in direct care staffing hours to support the complex physical and emotional care needs of our residents. And I'll talk a little bit about that direct care funding in just a moment. There are six different collective agreements. And so just note that there's um, an error in our package. There's six different collective agreements across the three homes, and there will be new collective agreements negotiated for ONA, the Ontario Nursing Association agreement for all three homes, as well as the Lee Manor OPSU and the Grey Gables OPSU agreements. Uh, along with the other uh, departments, long-term care, uh, is impacted on regarding the non-union salary review as well. So the long-term care staffing increase supplement, that's the direct care hours. This is the ministry's commitment to increase staffing levels and provide more direct care for residents. The ministry is providing new funding across the sector. There are three components to the funding. The goal of the funding is to support long-term care home licensees to enable the hiring of more staff to increase direct care hours um, direct care is defined as a hands-on, is defined as hands-on care provided to residents that includes, but is not limited to, assessments, feeding, bathing, toileting, lifting, moving residents, medical, therapeutic treatments, medication, administration. It's really everything under that nursing envelope. So registered nurses, registered practical nurses, personal support workers fall under direct care, the definition of direct care. The province has advised that direct care funding will range from $1,304.75 to $1,753.70 per bed per month. Funding announcements are anticipated to be received in April. So to avoid creating a budget shortfall, the base amount of $1,304.75 per bed has been budgeted. So this budget, as presented, maintains the current level of direct care hours of three hours and 42 minutes per resident per day and does not provide for an increase in direct care hours. If we were to increase uh, in direct care hours with this budget, it would have an impact on the levy. The direct care funding would not cover it based on the low end of the funding range. So when the funding announcement is received, we will review and propose opportunities for adjustments or increases in direct care hours to the Long-Term Care Committee of Management. Our goal does continue to be an average of four hours of direct care per day by 2025. Raw food <clears throat> is another expenditure that where we're seeing uh, as everyone else's inflationary pressures and, and rising costs. The ministry provides $12.07 per resident day for raw food, and the levy requirement for the three homes in addition to that is $78,400, and this represents the county contribution of $0.68 cents per resident day. This is unchanged from the 2023 budget and supports the purchase of um, local beef, um, local produce, uh, some of those kind of frills <laughs> uh, when we have the chance. A note on COVID-19 pandemic, the funding for uh, COVID-19 uh, prevention and management funding was discontinued effective April, 2023. This has resulted in, staff, in us reviewing our prevention practices and ensuring that we are managing our compliance within the funding parameters. Uh, the long-term care administration budget is funds the director of long-term care office and includes the quality specialist, clinical specialist, support services, education leave, administrative assistant. 
And what looks different uh, this year from last year is the addition of the infection prevention and control um, leads in each of the homes for which we do have funding from the province. Uh, and now looking at Gray Gables, so the following uh, sections are a highlight of each of the homes. So the Gray Gables operating capital budget has a net levy requirement of 2.4, a little over 2.4 million, uh, resulting in an increase of $439,800. And this, this sentence that I'll say about Gray Gables is consistent across all three homes. This proposed levy uh, maintains the operational needs with employee compensation retention, operating with increased supply charges and maintaining the, the aging building conditions. I just wanted to highlight that at Gray Gables, this budget includes the just over 1.4 million that's funded by the province for the behavioral support transition unit, which is home to 18 residents provided, provided specialized enhanced care for behavioral support. The 2024 capital budget uh, contribution is an increase of $9,200 from 2023. And these capital projects include lifestyle, a life cycle replacement of equipment, uh, self-funded debenture repayments for the roof projects um, and other capital projects that are listed. They're also listed here. And we can, um, if anyone has any questions, Lee Manor operating and capital has a net levy requirement increase of $974,500 over the 23 budget. Uh, and their uh, capital budget is an increase of $213,000. Uh, for the same thing, the life cycle replacement of equipment, we have a, a long go, a long, well, a 10 plus year plan of the replacement of the fleet of lifts, the beds and mattresses. Um, IT equipment. So some of those things are just on a consistent cycle. Uh, I will just highlight um, the engineering assessment for future air makeup and boiler system replacement. And that's slotted for 2024 to ensure that we're making sound decisions um, on what to do with the air makeup and boiler system replacement, what makes sense uh, and what's the best way to use um, funds to, to make good decisions about what we're doing with that system. It's been that the replacement of the air makeup and boiler system has been on the plan for some time and things change. So we, we want to have experts in to give us some good advice. Rockwood Terrace has um, an increase of 666,000 over 2023 and in highlighting their capital, um, this is not a new approach. Rockwood Terrace capital can be challenging to predict. We want to make sure we're providing a safe and comfortable environment, but also balance spending knowing that the move into the, the new Rockwood is not far away. So we make replacements based on safety and need. If things can be delayed, then we, we delay it. Um, if there can be a repair, versus a replacement, we, we do that. Um, and some of the items like spas, so tubs, we can actually move into the new building. So some things we can move over and some we can't. So we're being very mindful about that as well. Redevelopment, uh, we saw the exciting change on the video. Uh, so as you know, we're in that process. So the update on this is a borrowing bylaw for 96.7 million was passed to apply for funding through Infrastructure Ontario for the project. The amount that Gray County will be required to borrow is dependent on the cost of the project, as well as redevelopment funding available from the province. An annual levy requirement of just over 1.3 million for the project has been set aside for a number of years with project costs paid from this source of funding. It's expected that the 6.3 million will remain in reserve for use in 2024. And a $600,000 levy increase has been built into the proposed budget with further phased in increases continued into 2025 and 2026 budgets. Uh, and that's an overview. And um, I'd like to thank the committee of management for the additional time uh, on November 14th that we took to go through 
those budgets and, and ask good questions. And the teams in the leadership teams in the homes uh, have done, and in partnership with the finance team, have done a lot of work to already mitigate where possible uh, and, and reduce budget lines wherever we could. Happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you, Jennifer. Councillor Ackles. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Warden, and through you to Jen. The uh, behavioral support transition unit is being by the province. How much longer before the county has to start putting money in to keep that program going? Thank you. Through you, Mr. Warden. Uh, good question. We have maintained, we've been in discussions and in partnership with the Southwest Lynn, which is now Ontario Health West, for a lot of years on this project, back to 2014, I think. Uh, and it has always been very clear that part of the commitment um, on both sides was that there would not be an impact on the levy. So far, uh, we have been able to sustain that. At this point, it continues to be a pilot. So this time every year we submit an interim report to Ontario Health West. They submit a report to the Ministry of Long-Term Care to secure funding to determine whether the pilot will continue another year. That's how it's been managed for behavioral support transition units that are in place. There's only a handful across the province for the last decade or so. None, none of the projects, as far as I know, the pilots have been made permanent. So we always recommend that it be made permanent so we have a sense of base funding. Um, so when we hear back from Ontario Health West and the province in terms of the plans beyond March 2024, we will have another opportunity to have that discussion to ensure that the funding provided meets the costs of running the, um, the transition unit. And if it doesn't, then we will go back to negotiating the terms of the agreement and whether or not we would continue. And so at that point, when we had that information, we would bring a report to Long-Term Care Committee of Management to discuss options and opportunities. Thank you, Jen. Anyone else? Councillor Greg. Thanks, Warden. And uh, I'll just, uh, I've got the three thoughts um, while I just juggle around. I'm going to go back to one particular item from Gray Gables, for instance, 22 budget for, I think it was resident life improvements or something was about 915 bucks. The actual spend in 23 is somewhere around a thousand dollars. The budgeted amount last year was 10,000 and it's 10,000 this year. Um, is that an item that council should look at and say, you know what, if we lower that budget to $5,000, it's still a 500% increase over the actual spend of the last couple of years. And we can still accomplish something and you've still got more budget allocation. Uh, that's the first one. What does that refer to? Um, the second question is, it looks like revenues are down significantly at Lee Manor. So I was just wanting to more to learn more on that information. Uh, and not only are they down, they're now budgeted for 24 uh, to reflect 23. And um, I think I saw something for new shade area or something for Lee Manor as a capital item. Just wondering if that's a replacement or is that something that council should look at in a year where um, the very first slide, when we see 24, 32, 36, percent increases in each of the homes and those are approximate there are many slides back that's very challenging to council so um, I'm just looking to kind of identify maybe some of the extras that are beyond just replacement sure thanks and through you Mr. Warden and if Mark is that if you could look at the shade area <laughs> well I because I, I can answer the first question right off the hop um, so thank you for those questions. The resident life enhancement GL line is funded by donations. So um, I think the flag there really is that we need to be ensuring that we're utilizing the donations as they've been intended, meeting with residents and making purchases that they have asked for um, to enhance their experience at Grey Gables. So, um, 
I do know during the pandemic, all of those kinds of things ground to a halt. So it's a, a good flag to make sure that we're meeting with residents and and utilizing those donation funds. When people make a donation, they, they wanna know that it's being used and not sitting in a bank account. Um, the revenue at Lee Manor, and I'm just gonna look to Marcus, but I, I'm part of the revenue being down during the pandemic was related to isolation beds, um, having to hold back beds. So private rooms were held as isolation beds. Uh, and then the number of outbreaks Lee Manor is the biggest home um, in the biggest center with the most visitors. And that has had an impact on their kind of ro forever rotating suspect or confirmed outbreaks, whether it be COVID, respiratory, other respiratory illnesses, gastrointestinal illnesses. And when you're in an outbreak, you need to be isolating individuals. And when you're in an outbreak, you aren't able to admit residents either. So revenues will be impacted by having empty bed days because of um, being closed for during outbreaks. Um, additionally, we are seeing a trend in residents moving in that don't have the means to afford preferred accommodation. And, um, and so working to try to manage that, it's always a balance of having an empty bed or having someone living in the bed paying something, but not necessarily the preferred rate. Anything else you would add, you wanna come up? Uh, thank you, and through, through you, uh, Mr. Warden, the other one aspect too that we're dealing with, especially at Lee Manor, which um, we've actually been in conversations with our uh, like-minded at Bruce County and that is, there's the, the new bill that passed to get people out of the hospital and that to get them out so that they're no longer tying up uh, hospital beds. They have the ability to offload and send them over to us as long as they're stable, they meet the acuity in that. The problem is, is that we're still figuring out now, quite a few months in, the actual funding structure of, of receiving that money now from the Ministry of Health, not the Ministry of Long-Term Care, who we've dealt with since our inception. So dealing with that side, we're having some tied up tied up funds that way, which we're still getting a lot of uh, uh, loose answers to get a definitive of how we're, how we're receiving that. And the shade, you know? Yeah, the, uh, again, the shade structure was an additional one added for the um, a covered area that meets the regulations for a smoking area away from the building. Uh, Lee Manor's been having um, a lot of issues with the fact that since they have to go to the edge of the property and all this kind of stuff that people are either smoking in the bus shelter, which then is just giving secondhand smoke to anyone there, or that people aren't even doing it and they're just staying at the front doors where we're then having to combat with them to get them to follow the regulations. So this is offering a simple structure for them to be at the regulatory one so that also it's, it reduces the risk for Lee Manor for any penalties if, if uh, someone from the ministry came to. I appreciate that because individuals standing, uh, there are many instances, according to our transit drivers, of individuals uh, habitating uh, in the transit stops, forcing the bus to stop, and they're not uh, desiring the service. So thank you. Okay, thank you for those questions. Councillor Debreen, did you have your hand up? Okay. Thank you, Warden Milne, and uh, through you to Jen. You were mentioning, sorry, um, you were mentioning over there uh, that hospitals have a new policy to expedite the departure from the hospital bed to a long term or a to st as long as they're stable. Are they taking priority over people who have been on wait list and thereby create and once they're there, they may not leave like you know, speaking from experience, um, you know, with my my mom being removed, having to move out of the hospital, getting a temporary space, but she's not required to leave. Can you 
elaborate on that and how that's affecting our ability to serve our residents? Thank you uh, through you, Warden Mel, as I collect my ability to uh, answer as diplomatically as I can. Um, this, the as you describe, is the case. Um, there, so I can't remember what bill it was um, to support the access and flow challenges that are being seen across the health system. Um, and there's a lot of flux and change happening in home and community care support services, formerly CCAC, now called on Henry Ontario Health and Home. It, so CCAC is now Ontario Health and Home. Uh, lots of flux sh shifting of leadership and, and staff in those um, organizations, which cause a lot of confusion. Um, we are working with our Ontario health team, so the Gray Bruce Ontario health team, working specifically on transitions, because um, I hate the words access and flow. We're talking about humans working, managing through the system. Um, so look, talking about transitions and how to have these multi sectors work together to look out for the best needs of the patient resident individual. Um, yeah, we are seeing a trend of admissions from hospital over community. And so I, I haven't, I don't know that there's a formal statement on that, <clears throat> but it does seem as if hospital discharges take priority uh, and certainly crisis. Um, crisis is a, uh, an indicator that can be added to someone's file that allows them to bump on the list. And so there does feel like there's some inequity across the system. It's something we're facing in a challenge with the Behavioral Support Transition Unit. We have residents who are able to be discharged to their home of choice, but they're not high enough on the list to be transferred to another long-term care home because every time a bed comes available, someone in crisis takes that bed. And so it just causes all these challenges with the system of people not being in the right place at the right time, getting the right care. Um, there are, there's the Ontario health team that's doing, a, doing work on that locally. There's a Southwest access and flow regional committee and I sit at that committee and there's an Ontario Health West access and flow advisory table and I sit at that table as well. It's not unique to Gray Bruce. It is a big, a big broad Ontario challenge um, and I don't know that there's an, an easy answer. Kim? This was uh, um, Bill 7 that was an amendment to the uh, fixing long-term care. And I think at the time that it was passed, there was a lot of focus on the $400 a day charge that might be levied if, if people chose or wouldn't move from hospital. I don't know that that part of it's had a lot of traction, but, but this aspect of it has. Yeah, thanks, Kim. I there's so been so many legislative changes. It's hard for me to keep track of all of the numbers and letters of the bills. Um, yeah, there was a lot of focus in the media about the ability to kind of force someone to go somewhere they didn't want to go. I can say that we haven't experienced that. We haven't had anyone move into our home because they were forced to by the hospital. So that's not happening. But the the legislation does allow this kind of trumping or popping on the on the list. Thank you, Jen, for uh, clarifying that. Any other questions on this portion? Okay, not seeing any. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, where do we want to go now? Anne-Marie. Excellent. That makes it a lot easier if she just comes up to the microphone. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Welcome and take it away. The floor is yours, please. Good afternoon, Council. So I'm starting with the Human Services Budget. Um, it is page 39 on the handout and 119 on the computer. 
So looking at the first section, uh, dealing with social services, so social services including Ontario Works and Early Learning and Child Care, we have um, a total requirement for operating capital of 3,567,000, which is an increase of 120,200 over 2023. Uh, the social assistance budget um, consists of an increase of um, 10,300, uh, and that is because we are having an increase in our um, non-SARS, as we call them, so our non-social assistance recipient funerals. Um, we average about 23 a year, uh, and we're finding this year and last year that that has um, increased. Uh, we usually have about a $66,000 budget. Um, we're at 70,000 as of November. Um, so we did increase that budget to um, because of, of the use. Um, so Ontario Works um, provides uh, financial assistance uh, for someone that is in need. It is temporary assistance. Our current caseload is around 1,270. Um, and our role of the caseworker has changed in 2023 to um, the province has taken out um, or taken away um, the employment part of Ontario Works, and um, that has now gone to Employ Employment Ontario. Along with that, left the funds um, in which we were administering the employment program. So in order to uh, look at the reduction in funds that we had, um, we had two or we have two layoffs of, as of January 1st. We have our van program. The van program was mainly used for employment. Um, so we have a full-time and a half-time uh, position that um, as will no longer exist as of January 1st. Um, our full-time position has taken a job within our housing department, though, so we're happy about that. Um, the province provides a average monthly caseload prediction for the next year. They are predicting that our caseload will increase by 6.7%. Um, so that um, has been uh, calculated within our, our funding amounts for 2024. Um, we also have um, a few other cuts in order to make our up our 173,000 that we um, had to that was reduced. Um, we looked at um, eliminating some of those employment focused supports, and we're putting that money back into doing um, assessments. We have a number of people on our Ontario Works caseload that um, will not work and should be assessed for ODSP. Um, so we were lucky enough that uh, there's very few physicians uh, around that do this type of work. Uh, and one of them locally is retiring and has decided that they will um, stay on part-time and do this for us. So uh, very excited that we're going to be able to provide that opportunity for, for more of our clients. So that, in a nutshell, is basically the Ontario Works um, budget. I would like to note, too, that there was no increase to Ontario Works for 2024 from the province. Uh, it will remain at $733 a month, uh, and that has been a no increase since 2018. So um, Ontario Works staffing, I should actually mention that we do have 28 staff and we have 18 caseworkers, works out to be approximately a caseload of about 70 to 75 people. Um, we do have our main office in Owen Sound and satellite offices in Durham, Meaford and Hanover. One change that we've noted for 2024 is our Markdale satellite office. Uh, our caseload there has actually gone down. Uh, but we are seeing an increase in Dundalk. So what we are doing is no longer having an open office, satellite office in Markdale. It'll be by appointment only, and we'll have by appointment only in Dundalk then too. So a little bit of a switch, just uh, mainly on where we're seeing the numbers. The next I'm going to go on to is our early learning and child care. And that is on page 120 of your screen and page 40 of the handout. So a couple of days ago, we re received our budget allocation from the province. So everything that you see in front of you has changed, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> um, some of the highlights um, that I can tell you is um, we did receive a change in our administration funding. Um, we will now have 5% administration funding instead of 10. It will have an impact to our budget of around $297,000. 
Um, it's not going to affect our levy for 2014 as we do have some mitigation funding to put towards it and then whatever else we require we'll put in reserves. We also are expecting an entirely new funding formula to come out in August of 2024. So the way early learning and childcare is funded right now is going to be completely changed. This was supposed to happen with the CWELC changes or, or was supposed to happen as of this year, but the province put it off for another year. August, we'll find out what that's going to look like. So we'll know a little bit better what, it, what our 2025 is gonna look like in, in August. Um, so some of the changes that I can talk a little bit about um, is that we do have an increase in wages, um, which is a very welcome increase. Um, our wage is now going to be up to uh, a cap or uh, let me get my notes here. Uh, $23.86. So that will certainly help with retention and with attraction. Uh, and in a couple of years, so by 2026, it will be up around the, the $30 mark for, for a cap. So um, more information on the um, wage floor and uh, will come in 2024. So we don't have all of the details, but as of January 1st, um, there will be an increase to um, our wage enhancement grant of $2. And then there is the um, another grant for RECs only of $2. So there's an incremental um, increase in wages, which is, is happening. So I thought for today, what I could do since all of these numbers have changed is just give you an idea of what we do and, and how it is funded, um, how things are funded in early learning and childcare. And then we will go to the community services committee in uh, the end of February with details, uh, a detailed budget. Um, we're still waiting for some guidelines and information from the province that are to come in January. Um, so this will give us an idea that will or give us some the information that we need in order to present a more fulsome budget to you. Um, so we have our licensed home care um, and licensed home care um, are, are obviously our, our residents that provide home care out of their um, homes. We have staff that provide support and we also provide funding. Um, some core operating funding to home child home uh, uh, child care providers. Um, we support 40 child care centers with over 2,500 spaces, um, and we provide funding for core operating, for maintenance and repairs, expansion funding, play-based and material equipment, wage enhancement funds, and special needs resourcing. So all of these are provincially funded. Some of them are cost shared with, uh, with the county and all of those funds are, are uh, put out to the community. Um, along with being a funder, the county also provides capacity building to all of our child care providers through professional development opportunities. Um, we are in centers providing support and we also have our early learning and child care hub that provides a space for peer support, mentoring, and training and resources. Um, it's run out of Sydenham and if you haven't had a chance to stop in, you should, it's quite fun. Um, it's uh, full of resources, resources that can be made, uh, borrowed, uh, and with having the ECE program in there through Georgian, um, it's being used by students now too, so it's great um, synergies there. We also run our own early on center and um, support and fund eight other early ons across the county. Um, our early on centers and family centers provide free high quality uh, programs for families and children age zero to six. Um, they help strengthen adult child relationships, uh, support parent education and child development. Uh, and all of our centers are very well used and very well attended. We provide subsidy programs for parents that need assistance with the cost of childcare. So anyone on OW would automatically uh, qualify for this subsidy. And as of 2023, we also started providing the Canada-wide early learning and childcare funds to childcare providers that have enrolled. And so that we parents now pay, we've had a reduction of 52.75% um, and um, a welcome, definitely welcomed by many of our parents. Uh, 90% of our child care providers have enrolled. And with the funding that we received for 2024, there was not a reduction in fees included in that. So we're assuming it would probably then be January or sometime in 2025 would be the next reduction. 
And we have 10 staff uh, that provide all of these services um, and of course help from our friends in finance. I don't know if anyone has any questions about social services before I move on to housing. Councilor Greg. Thank you, Warden. And two quest quick questions on page 162. And you may, I apologize if you already flew through this. There's, you did a great job. There's a lot to digest there. Uh, there's a line, it's a ledger account 64102 and it's professional consulting fees for $350,000. Uh, that wasn't there two years ago. Last year was uh, $350. Uh, year end projected spend is $100. I'm just wondering a little further to what that might uh, relate to. And you mentioned about a subsidy for daycare that goes to OW recipients. Just wondered if you could expand on that. I just, um, I was expecting if there was a subsidy, it might go to like through some employment program or, or something. So that, I just wanted to learn more. Thanks. Um, thank you. I skipped over that one. Uh, so that is our capital. So capital, we are looking at the redevelopment of early on. So that is the page 162 that you're referring to. Um, so the fees that we had put in there for 2023, where we were hoping to be far enough along in our discussions um, with uh, school board that for development, that we would be able to uh, have some soft um skills done so that we would look at um, getting the architectural and whatnot. We're not there yet. So the the funding that we have right in there is for the actual redevelopment. We're still really hoping that we might still be putting shovels in the ground, spring, June, that sort of idea. Um, and if that happens, that's why we put the money in there. Um, we're looking at redeveloping because we do not meet accessibility guidelines for 2025. Um, we've outgrown the site and in Hanover, there's parking concerns all the time, sorry. And uh, so we're just looking at trying to, you know, mitigate some of those those concerns. Um, but we're just not far enough yet in our um, in our conversations with the board yet. Uh, the other one is, um, so anyone that's on OW automatically qual uh, um, qualifies for subsidy because of their wage. So it's, it's wage... Um, is it, it, that or whatever a person earns, it's income related. So anyone that's on OW, if they are moving into employment, then they would automatically get subsidized um, care. Councilor DeBreen. Thank you, Warden. And through you, at the beginning of the early learning and child care section, you mentioned a budget allocation has now been received and it's now 5% instead of 10%. So we've been slashed by 50%. What was the dollar number? You, it was 290,000? Oh. 297,000. You then indicated that there was going to be wage increases elsewhere. Do you anticipate that this budget allocation is going to be recovered somewhere else through new funding, hopefully? I mean, if we all had a crystal ball, or is this yet one of our, you know, the famous downloading of services? We don't know. Thank you. So we're finding other ways to fund it this year because we have a totally new funding model coming from the province in August. So we don't know what to expect, um, but it didn't make sense for us to rehaul everything we're doing right now when we don't know the funding for eight months from now. So that's why we're looking at that and hoping that it's not a traditional downward. Councillor Eccles. Philosophical question, Anne-Marie. How many of these programs are really mandatory? All of them um, are mandatory cost shared um, between ourselves and the province. Um, the only thing that is not mandatory is some of our um, social initiatives that we pay for. So those have been 
groups that have come to hear the council and council has in the past said, yes, we will fund $98,000 for a rec program for the Y for um, children, families that make a lower income. Those are the only ones that are not mandated, the social initiatives and the funerals. What all does that add up to over the time? So those are listed on page 122 or 42 of the um, written package or printed package. And I believe it's around $299,000. Um, it includes um, Beaver Valley Outreach Recreation, United Way 211, um, some task force, safe and sound, keystone counseling for school aged children, and um, our Y program for um, uh, children's recreation program. And there's $5,000 to support low income families for car seats and cribs and baby items. Any other questions before we move on to housing? Okay. Anne Marie? Thank you. Okay, so the housing um, section starts on page 163. Oh, sorry, that's my bad. I got that wrong. The written part starts on page 123 or page 43 in your handout. The housing uh, requires an increase of uh, 590,100 um, and has a capital and operating departmental require net requirement of 8,733,400. Uh, um, within uh, the housing department, we have a number of um, programs in which we, we run, which um, number one is our um, own housing. Uh, we have and we own and operate 993 units of community housing. This includes 27 apartment buildings and 230 family homes and our recent addition of 12 supportive units. We house over 1,500 residents um, in our Gray County housing. We provide funding and support nine other nonprofits that house around 800 residents and we also have a number of rent supplements and housing allowances throughout the county. Um, so we're up probably around um, 2,700, 2,800 households that we, uh, or people that we house, um, about close to 3% of Gray County's population. Um, we provide tenant services, social services, maintenance and custodial services to all sites. Um, we have a 10-year um, capital program to ensure preventative maintenance, our buildings upkeep and focus on energy efficiency. And we run um, rent programs, uh, provincial programs, um, such as rent supplement, repairs, uh, and other social programs. We provide, we keep the wait list um, for all of Gray Counties for any of the um, multi-residential nonprofits um, so that there's only one place that a person has to apply rather than all. We have a short-term shelter program that provides emergency shelter for residents experiencing chronic homelessness or episodic homelessness. We currently have 110 Gray County residents experiencing chronic homelessness, meaning that they've been homeless for more than uh, six months in a year. And in our first year of the uh, short-term shelter program from September uh, 22 to 23, we have 87 people that were housed that still remain housed at this time. And our housing department has 32 staff. Looking at our revenue, um, we do have some sources of revenue. Uh, some of it comes from uh, federal grants from the uh, feds. Um, we also have um, rent uh, that and that comes in and other expenses such as or other revenues from our laundry. Um, we have decreased um, 
the funding has decreased uh, from the feds. So with the federal funding, it is for our debenture amounts. So our mortgages, as our mortgages expire, the federal funding goes down, but it doesn't always coincide with the mortgages. <laughs> it has its own sort of uh, schedule. Um, so sometimes what we do is we'll look over a couple of years and then we'll just try and mitigate the funding um, by taking some from reserves and then paying some back so that we're not having a large impact on our budget. So that's one of the things that we're doing this year. Um, we have estimate we will be collecting rent in around around 4,368,000 from our tenants. Uh, this is an increase of about $70,000 from um, 2023. Uh, but we also have bad debt write-off, which has increased. Um, one of the reasons that is for someone who has left us that owes us rent, um, during COVID, there was a massive backlog with the landlord tenant board, uh, and they are still working through the backlog. So we have people that have been uh, living with us and not paying rent for some time, or um, they no longer live with us, but it's still taking a, a very long time for us to, um, to, to pass that on. Um, overall tenant related revenue uh, reflects a budget increase of $30,400. Our operating expenses um, for total property reoccurring, um, we have uh, an increase of $258,000. Um, salary uh, has and benefits um, are some of that. Our increase in utility costs, $166,400 for hydro, natural gas, and water. Um, and one of the main reasons for that has been the carbon tax. Uh, 990 or 99,600 for building maintenance and repairs. Um, as our buildings get older, as costs go up, um, as contractor wages go up, we find an increase in repairs. Um, waste removal, um, we have a, an increase in waste removal just with renewal of some contracts and we have one municipality that's um, no longer providing the service. So we've added that in. Um, we have 67,400 for snow removal. These are based on actuals for 22 and 23. Fuel prices and insurance prices have obviously increased, um, but it's really difficult to know how many times you're going to need your driveway plowed. So it's just one of those things that we take an average. Um, we have an increase in travel for some of our um, emergency host or hotels and county owned buildings. Um, and we also have a $22,000 increase in insurance premiums. We actually upped our deductible. Um, Intac is no longer providing insurance for any multi-residential nonprofit provider. Um, so there is very little to choose from. Uh, and of course, we are a high risk um, sector. So we are seeing increases right across the board with all of our nonprofits and ourselves. Um, our, by raising our deductible for $50,000 from 25, we actually saved $65,000 this year and still have a $22,000 increase. So we would have had almost a, a $90,000 increase had we not done that. Um, and all of our nonprofits are experiencing the same thing. Um, we do have a delegation for Roma or we have asked for one on that. So um, it's, it's certainly uh, going to have an impact. Um, some of the savings we had, we did have a decrease in uh, property taxes due to the multi-residential tax rate being adjusted. Um, we had an increase in our homelessness prevention funding, so we ended up with some more admin funds, and same with our COCHI. 14th Street. Um, 14th Street, this has changed um, since um, earlier today. It was approved um, to for our debenture um, a payment of $112,000 a year to be uh, funded through one-time funds. Um, we will no longer require um, any levy funding. So there's another $50,000 that can come off um, of this year's budget. We will, without a mortgage, um, we sh the rents from 14th Street should um, maintain the building. Uh, Nonprofit housing, we do have a, an increase of $50,000 this, again, is largely due to our federal conditional grant, um, which has been reduced, and also the cost of insurance. The provincial funded programs, these are a number of 100% funded uh, programs from the province. Um, we have our rent supplement program, which is the Canada-Ontario Housing Benefit. Um, we have our Canada-Ontario Community Housing Initiative, Pri Ontario Priorities Housing Initiative. Um, and our homelessness prevention. And those provide funds for us to um, do renovations, do rent supplements, capital projects, 
Um, it also provides all of our homelessness funds. Um, and um, we use that through um, John Hostel rent supplements, emergency housing services. And we also provide a sustainable housing benefit, which provides a person last in for, uh, last month's rent. Um, it also helps out with utility arrears. So it keeps people in their house rather than um, finding themselves um, being evicted for arrears. And next we have our capital budget. Um, for our capital budget, we have a total of uh, $5 million in projects budgeted for 2024. Some of those are carryovers from 2023. Um, and we have, this includes also in that total is $514,000 in which we do for preventative maintenance, um, such as repairs, um, repairs, appliance replacement, um, security elevator repairs, site improvements, and other projects that sustain our, um, our 994 units. Um, we applied earlier this year for a federal conditional grant um, from the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. Um, we received um, $3.5 million for the next three years for capital, and that's to go towards 30% of our capital. So we pay the 70% and they pay 30. Um, it focuses in on energy efficiency, accessibility, but anything under that, anything could be included. Um, so we are fortunate enough that's going to help us in the long run with our capital projection um, by um, that injection of, of, um, of funds. And the other transfer to reserve that we have is our affordable housing fund um, at $647,000. The affordable housing fund is used to build or renovate um, uh, housing to support our most vulnerable residents, um, future Potential future projects include a motel for short-term shelter for those experiencing homelessness, funding of a nonprofit seniors building. I believe Lutheran um, had had already has already been to council for that. The redevelopment of community housing in Dundalk, um, and um, also funds went to assist with our 14th Street build. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Anne Marie. Any questions? Councillor Gregg. Thanks, Warden. Uh, quickly, slide 164, Anne Marie, is on housing. Uh, it does contain revenues for operating for 2024 of $9.531 million. I'm just wondering, can you provide some context in terms of is that down? Is that up? Is it um, constant? Uh, what's some background in terms of the revenues uh, informing that department? Sorry, that was 164. Um, operating um, da, 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 revenue, the 9 million. So it all depends on what that revenue is. Um, that could be our revenue would be considered any of our provincial dollars that we get. Um, they vary depending on the year. Um, that would include our um, funding for homelessness again, provincial, which varies. Um, the only other revenue in there would be our rents too. And those usually stay a bit steady. They traditionally had been going down a bit, but now they seem to have leveled off. Um, so that would include any federal funds that we might receive, any provincial funds for any of the programs that we run, our um, revenue that we receive from tenants and any laundry fees that might be, or laundry revenues that may be in there. So those are our four sources of revenue. If I could then, uh, so the balance is funded by levy. Um, is there a substantial fluctuation, decrease, or or, or it's too hard to, to comment because of the provincial federal transfers? Or, or can it be, kind of be broken down in terms of what's under municipal control? So our levy goes towards mainly towards our buildings. Um, so whatever the rent doesn't cover in our buildings, that's what we what we contribute to. Um, and that goes with the increase of utility costs, um, increase of taxes, insurance. Those are the things that, that that would go for. So it would be your normal certain percentage each year, according to inflation. Any other 
Questions? Okay. Well, thank you, Anne Marie. Appreciate all that. Where do we go next, Madam Clerk? Or do I just wait for somebody else to come up? Yeah, there we go. Kevin's coming up. Yeah. Paramedic services. So, uh, Kevin, welcome. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, Council. I think I'm the last of the day, not before lunch, so that's good. <laughs> uh, so for paramedic services, uh, paramedic services provides emergency and non-emergency medical care to our community 24-7, seven, seven days a week. In 2022, paramedic services responded to 14,951 patient calls for service and 16,735 emergency coverage standbys. So that's when a call happens. Uh, we have to move a unit to make sure we don't have a delayed response or try to minimize that response as much as possible. 97% of these calls were uh, for the patient carried calls were for emergencies and only 3% were for non-emergency transfers. Over the past five years, we've seen call volumes increase by over 33% with the majority of that increase being in the last two years, 21 and 22. Top of the increase in call volumes, the consistent challenge we face is the large geographic area of Gray County. 4,500 square kilometers. One base location is usually just under 600 square kilometers, which I think about my days working in the city of Toronto, that was the size of Toronto where we had 100 units or 110. And uh, obviously call volume is the issue there. And, uh, and and us here is call volume and also geography, but we just have one truck in that same area. It's part of our community paramedic <clears throat> program and working with physicians, nurse practitioners and community agencies. We offer care in the home, treating elderly, who are often frail with chronic diseases like COPD, congestive heart failure, and diabetes, as well as palliative patients. Our goal is to treat the patient in the home uh, early, preventing their symptoms from getting worse and preventing a transport in an ambulance or being admitted or treated in the hospital. In our community a paramedic home visit program, we have a roster uh, today of 437 patients, but we've been over 450. And as well, we have uh, 46 participants that uh, we see at our community clinics. Uh, throughout the county. Our supportive outreach team uh, provides primary mental health and addictions care for community members who are homeless or are precariously housed. At any given time, we have uh, about 90 or 100 people that we're seeing at any given time. The Public Access to Fibrillation Program, uh, we provide oversight, supplies, and support for 196 sites. Our 911 <clears throat> and community paramedic team consists of 82 full-time and 55 part-time paramedics, five supervisors, three managers, equipment supply technician, three administrative support, uh, one doing administration, one scheduling, and one for our CP administration. The uh, CP program also has a, a medical director. The SOS team consists of addiction specialist, physician as a consult, a nurse practitioner, two mental health counselors, a social navigator, and just recently with some support from West Gray Police, uh, there's been two part-time peer supporters added to that program. Our services are, are delivered out of eight base locations across the county, One Sound, Meaford, Craig Lee, Chatsworth, Martindale, Dundalk, Durham, and Hanover. And our current fleet consists of 15 ambulances, nine emergency response vehicles, and one emergency response trailer. So for our budget, uh, pages 131 to 134, the 2024 paramedic services budget includes a net departmental requirement, total operating capital of $9,157,900 compared to $8,259,000 in 2023, an increase of $898,000 or 10.8% 8, 10 10.87 increase over uh, 2023. Now that'll change after the after we talked about the enhancement this morning, but that uh, this was based upon the original uh, deployment. Uh, uh, that was in the in the budget. <clears throat> the, the 2024 operating budget reflects an 860,900 increase as compared to 2023. The Ministry of Health provides current year funding based upon 50% of the previous year's actuals uh, adjusted for public sector accounting board uh, eligible expenditures such as amortization, future benefit, and future WSI, WSIB costs without an inflationary increase, which we lost in 2019. The 2024 budgeted grant amount of 9276000 has been calculated using the assumption that that funding model will, will not change 
and it hasn't changed in a number of years since 2018. This grant excludes provincial funding provided by Ontario Health and the Ministry of Long Health Ministry of Long Term Care for community paramedicine and also our supportive outreach services. It also uh, doesn't include the money for the dedicated off-road nurse program, which now started in November of this year. As for salaries and benefits, excluding the community paramedicine program, wages paid, transportation staff, performing repairs on paramedic services vehicles, and the service re review enhancement. So more or less just our general operating uh, costs uh, have went up $493,100 as compared to 2023. Salaries and benefits make up just under 80% of our operating expenditures. Through COVID, we've seen a significant increase in the cost of our medical supplies and our drugs, and sometimes even at times even hard to get drugs where we run short. Uh, we've seen an increase uh, in 2023 uh, of around $60,000, so the budget reflects that change. We are funding 30,000 from levy because we hope that the, this next year we will see a reduction in that area. Um, the service enhancements, I covered that this morning, and I can answer any questions further on that, but uh, I really think that with that modeling tool that we have, based upon the, the uh, call volume that we've been able to put into it, uh, that it will put us on the right path to uh, meet the needs of our, our call volumes. And uh, again, this is something that we committed with that report, that we would come back here on a, on a yearly basis and report back where we are at, so people, our council can make a decision of our, of our next steps forward. Um, for community paramedicine programs, <clears throat> a request to Ontario Health West has, has been made for additional uh, community paramedic uh, funding and also funding to cover our CPLTC, which we get funding from the Ministry of Long-Term Care. The budget assumes a $150,000 increase uh, with $31,000 allocated to CP and $118,000 allocated to CPLTC. Between these two programs, we have uh, three paramedic units uh, on seven days a week and they uh, offer coverage or, or response uh, 12 hours a day. If the funding is not secured that we've requested, uh, we will have to look at reducing our service. The 2024 community paramedicine budget expenditures total 4094 with 397.1 in funding from Ontario Health West, and there is a, a levy impact of 12,300. For the community paramedic program that's funded by long-term care, the agreement provides a million dollars a year, and this was based upon estimates we made in 2021. An additional 118,000 has been included for the budgeted increase. Uh, due to increased costs, a levy contribution is required for this program of 84,900. Supportive outreach services is uh, primarily uh, funded by Ontario Health West uh, with funding of uh, $360,000. And this year they did give us an uh, inflationary increase of 10,800. Uh, in report PSR CW 0523, uh, the funding is not sufficient to fund the program. So council did approve us to use cannabis legalizations uh, and safe restart funding to get us to March 31st, 2024. And again, we've uh, requested uh, more funds from Ontario Health West to be able to ensure that program continues. The total expenditures of that program are 565,100. Uh, if we don't secure the funding, we'll have to look at some sort of uh, uh, either service reduction or looking at other options for uh, funding for that program. For uh, peer support, the Supporting Ontario First Responders Act 2016 is a key component of, comp is of a comprehensive strategy to deal with first responder PTSD and uh, Gary County paramedics are uh, affected by that legislation. Included in the act are strategies to prevent or mitigate PTSD. And one requirement is, to, is the, for the employer to have uh, policies and prevention programs for uh, paramedics. The 2024 budget uh, continues to build on the program that we started in 2018. It invests in programs to prevent, reduce operational stress and PTSD and provides training and peer support members, an online peer support referral and resource program. Every time we do a call that potentially is a, a stress call uh, based upon our electronic charting, it uh, sends a message through our, our peer support app and your peer support team's notified and they're able to follow up with the crew. 
The initiative also includes training for the peer support team. It includes a family day event, <clears throat> staff time, clinical oversight of our team by a psychologist, uh, interventional care by the psychologist or short like emergency care. And also there's uh, there's 11,300 increase uh, to the to the budget this year. And that's for uh, additional training in suicide intervention. Other notable items in the budget, public access DFIP program uh, proposed budget is 22,600, which is an increase of 12,600 over 2023. We've seen an increase in the cost of supplies, batteries and pads, and also uh, our, our number of defibrillators, public access are, is 196 now, but it's up from about 150 when this first started. There is some uh, money set aside for uh, training supplies, uh, 26,500, uh, which is funded from the equipment reserve. The, the dedicated offload nurse uh, provides a payment to Bright Shores of $97,500 for a dedicated offload nurse in Owen Sound. This is a new program for us. It's just really underway, started in November. We have heard from Bright Shores though that they may have difficulty staffing this program January through March. So have requested that they let us know how much they've spent to date, and we will uh, staff it based upon what's left with the paramedic. Uh, so again, we'll just need to make sure we don't go over budget in that, in that amount. The budget also includes uh, an operations supervisor to backfill the operations manager during the construction of the Durham base. This will allow the operations manager to focus on the project and the goal of reducing external professional and project management costs. Budget shows 138,000 cost is funded from the Paramedic General Reserve. When the project's completed, it will be incorporated into the total cost and decision we made at that time, whether it's been included in the debenture amount. Annual transfers to reserves. 2024 operating budget includes annual transfer reserves of 1,424,800 for the following. Um, and some of this will be impacted because of the changes we made this morning. Uh, 744,600 to fund new capital purchases, the service enhancement, 663 for our existing uh, assets, $14,000 for paramedic jackets, and uh, $3,100 for uh, uh, helmets and bags, which generally have a 15 year life expectancy. Vehicle operations <clears throat> budget has a levy requirement of $956,100. This is an increase of $101,000 and reflects an increase of $84,400 for fleet repairs. The, uh, the difficulty with us getting vehicles have resulted in uh, higher kilometers and obviously higher maintenance and repair costs. We did uh, fund $25,000 reserve. We feel that as our fleet, we start to get in this rotation now that we're ordering year ahead, we will be able to correct our fleet and that hopefully will bring those maintenance and repair costs down. Our insurances went up uh, 13500 We've increased our num amount for tires of $4,000. And there is uh, $11,000 in here that's uh, funded from the reserve uh, to just augment the, our emergency response vehicles to have better access for the paramedics to get the equipment out of the back uh, as opposed to, like, to be in, in behind the seat as opposed to in the back just to facilitate uh, easier access to that and also make it ensure it remains secure. As far as our capital budget, uh, the 24, 24 capital budget has levy impact <clears throat> totaling of $197,300, an increase of $37,100 over 2023. The increase is a result of increase in the contribution to, re to reserve for the Durham base bill to phase in the levy impact of the debenture that will be required in 2025. The 2024 budget includes the construction of the new Durham base, land acquisition design, and construction, all are expected with approval uh, in 2024. Portion of the cost will be funded by reserve and development charges with the balance being funded by the venture. The venture will begin in 2025 and the port portion of the, and a portion of the repayment will be offset by the development charges. So vehicle and equipment purchases uh, for 2024. Uh, we, we will be receiving uh, four ambulances in the 2024 budget. That was two from 2023 and uh, two from 2024, which we ordered in February of this year. They take about 20 months now to get them in. In our fleet right now, we have 15 ambulances 
and they're on a six year replacement cycle and uh, generally have, you know, 300,000, but some of them right now are close to 400,000 kilometers on them. Actually, months a couple are over uh, uh, when we get rid of them. There's two super paramedic supervisor units. They're on a five year replacement, uh, two power load stretchers. And then there's also eight mechanical CTPR devices. This is to ensure we have enough for every truck for those. And they're uh, from Safe Restart. Uh, this was approved by council earlier this year, and uh, it's been a significant benefit to the paramedics with this longer CPR time and safer for transport. It actually allows us to leave the scene earlier as well because we can ensure consistent CPR as we're moving the people out of the house. Um, the next part <clears> of <throat> the capital purchase to support service delivery. Um, we will be adjusting this and looking at this because this will reduce now with the new plan that's in place. Um, so I won't spend a whole lot of time there, but there will be a reduction in, in the number of, uh, uh, of vehicles and they obviously be less monitors and less power loads and less stretchers. Um, but uh, more, more or less, we'll, we'll have to buy two this year of everything. Because what, what's happening is, is we're actually keeping two trucks um, for the up staff and uh, we'll, we'll use that equipment for those. And uh, also this year, our HVAC system was to be done this year, but because of delays, um, they won't uh, be done until 2024. So that's going to move forward as a capital project. I don't take any questions. If you Thank you, Kevin. Any questions? Councillor McKay. Yes, Kevin, uh, just through you, Warden. Uh, the one where it says community paramedicine for long-term care are our paramedics going into long-term care buildings that we have and why are they um usually we would receive our funding from the ministry of health uh, ontario health uh, ministry of health but uh, with the uh, community paramedic funding that came in 2021 that funding was uh, actually funded through the Ministry of Long-Term Care. And the idea was, is there was the criteria for that program is that you were waiting for placement in long-term care, you're waiting to be assessed for long-term care, or you potentially in the future could require services of long-term care. Um, so that's what qualifies you for that funding uh, or qualifies patients to be able to be in the, in, the, in the program. And that's where we get our funding for because the, the plan is, is hopefully we're able to keep people in their homes longer and uh, then not require the services of long-term care. So it's really just a funding source. So the, the, the CP program is funded more or less two thirds by long-term care and one third by Ontario Health, which I hope someday that it goes under one because we have two reporting bodies and it gets very confusing, especially when they're looking at metrics and stats. Thank you, Kevin. You're good with that. All right. Any other questions? Councillor Gregg? Um, I did have two questions. The first one, Councillor McKay just spoke to it, but um, I did find it interesting how two years ago in 2022, that was seemingly a moneymaker, a revenue, a positive revenue generator, and now it's flipped to 85,000 net levy costs as opposed to 85,000 revenue you kind of touched on i don't know if you wanted to explain what happened two years ago when when we had a positive revenue flow from it um yeah and then i'll just i would say probably two years ago the best of my ability was like especially 2021 2022 when we were in the throes of the pandemic and staffing crisis being able to uh staff we always ensured we had a unit for for cp for exacerbations but we would pull from there to keep 911 staff. And uh, so now that we're running at pretty much full capacity, not not always, but uh, we're definitely a lot better state than what we were, uh, that we are running it at full capacity would be the majority of that. But also uh, this is some of the things we run into when you get the, the dollars and you figure it out, every year it goes down the road with your inflationary increases that they don't give you inflationary increases back, which that's what we've requested from Ontario Health is that we, we run a deficit after a while. You know, that was really supposed to be three years of funding. Now it's five years of funding. Pretty sure it's base, but uh, there's been no inflationary increases. 
Okay, thanks for that response. And you mentioned uh, looking to renew ambulances and it will offset um, repairs and maintenance. We're familiar with that your department works well with Pat's department to do some repairs and maintenance on the ambulances. When you spoke about reducing repairs and maintenances, are you referring to external costs for parts or are you including like interdepartmental transfers that would occur where Pat's just billing time out? Um, so just wondered if you could kind of split that. We actually drilled into this fairly, uh, fairly close because we were looking at these increases to see what it was. And uh, like, were we pushing out more maintenance as far as labor? But it really, a lot of it is around parts. And uh, like, there's not much that uh, the transportation mechanics don't do. There may be some specialty stuff and, uh, and warranty, but uh, they do all our maintenance and, and do an excellent job at it. And uh, um, I, I really think what it is, is we're, we had high mileage units. We haven't been able to catch up. I'm really hopeful in the next, you know, going forward starting this year, that we will catch up. But uh, but I, I think that's probably the biggest part of it is, is, the, is the higher kilometers. You put 400,000 kilometers on a GM, you've pretty much built two cars. Did uh, anybody else, was there another? Andrea, Andrea, you had your hand up, please. Thank you for you, the chair. It's related to what was just presented. Thank you for those details, but also to the previous, the social services presentations we've had. The number of times that we've all heard today, um, but this funding has not changed since 2018, 2019. Meanwhile, the cost of living is going up and, you know, this has been frozen. Oh, but, you know, the cost of food is going up. So I'm going through and I'm highlighting where I can see it in the documents, but I'm also hearing verbal extra details that have come forward today. I think each and every one of us, it, it, it could be well equipped to be able to provide a consolidated um, version of those key points to our constituents when we go back and talk about it, because it's hard to go through line by line looking for the numbers of times we've heard that the province funding has ceased, yet we're still expected, we're still looking for a way to fill the gaps to make sure that we don't have constituents who are lacking services because something got frozen earlier. It, the, the trend is enormous as we're looking through this. So I don't know if there's a way that the finance staff can help us consolidate all those into a one pager, or if it's just going to be homework of highlighting and, and re-listening to the, the verbal presentations that are not contained within the documents. But I would like to see that consolidated because I think that message has to be there loud and clear that we are trying to fill that missing middle. We're all struggling with what we're doing on the municipal level. We're, we're dealing with frozen funds coming to the province and who's left in the middle, the upper tier. So somehow we have to get that messaging out. It's not going to change what's going on, but, but we have to start, we have to go back and say to our constituents, there is an X percentage of increase on this county budget this year. By the way, here is what we're dealing with that comes from the province. Yep, what she said, exactly, 100%. Kim, you wanna say, add something? So um, if what you're looking for, we can make a, a summary sheet that shows um, provincial funding that's either been reduced, frozen, or or just eliminated. That's right, yes? And, okay. Thank you, Andrea. Any other uh, questions on paramedic services? Not seeing any. Thank you very much, Kevin. Appreciate it, as always. So that uh, that concludes what we uh, had set out to do today. Doesn't preclude, uh, you know, further work uh, in a week from now when we meet again to go through the rest of the budget. We don't need item number six, as I understand it. Uh, number seven, I don't believe there's any other business here in front of us today. Oh, Mary Lou, sorry. Okay, the floor is yours, dear uh, Mary Lou. No worries, you just couldn't see me. 
Uh, I was just going to do uh, a summation for you, Mr. Warden. Um, so after um, CIO Wingrove's report this morning, uh, we were sitting at a 7.23% increase. And with the reduction in the transfer to reserve in transportation for facilities and domes of 100,000, uh, that brings us to 7.09%. So if you wanted to get to a nice even number, we would need about $62,500, which um, coincidentally, <laughs> um, we did receive the uh, CCBF funding announcement yesterday. Uh, the word that's otherwise known as gas tax, we'll continue to call it that. And that increase is $67,248. If, if you're interested in knowing that number. Thank you, Mary Lou. And I was going to say, well, we haven't done planning yet, but that, that your numbers are good. Thank you very much. Was there anything else, Mary Lou? No? Okay. All right. Well, uh, no other business. I look for a motion to adjourn. Councillor Hutchison, Councillor Patterson. All those in favor? That's carried. We're adjourned. Yeah, that's right. If everybody's interested in the Holstein Parade, it's tomorrow at one o'clock in Holstein.